good to have everybody here this morning. We'll uh, we'll have prayer and get into the lesson. Father, Lord, I need your wisdom. I need the gift of teaching. Father, we need your presence here today. Glorify yourself and bless your word. In thy name we pray. Amen. All right, now, if you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah 6 with me. Isaiah chapter number 6. And uh, verse number 9. Get that in one hand, the book of uh, Acts. Uh, chapter 28. In the other. Acts 28, 25. Acts 28, 25, one hand, John chapter number 6 and verse number 10. John 6, 10. I mean, Isaiah 6, 10. <laughs> They're all good, just turn anywhere, amen. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Isaiah 6.10, the scripture says, in verse 9, Isaiah 6.9, he said, Go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their e eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Now that's a powerful prophecy because what it means is it had a direct application at that time, 700 BC, but it also has a future application. How do we know that? Look where it's quoted in Isaiah chapter number, I mean in Acts chapter number 28, verse number 25. Acts 28, 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word well spake the Holy Ghost by science the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So we have an Old Testament text and a New Testament application of that text. The application is made by the Apostle Paul. You remember I told you the book of Acts was probably completed sometime in 60, 65 A.D., possibly even later than that. But we feel for certain that it was completed before 70 A.D. when the destruction of the temple under Titus took place. And so what happens here in the book of Acts chapter number 28 is that God now has officially blinded Israel, the Jewish people, to the gospel of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's fact. I mean that's one of these things if you look at Romans chapter number 11 and you see where he has blinded them then you can say well now we know that's a fact but the next thing it begs the question why? If God blinded these people who are the who are the keepers of the oracles of God to whom the prophets came who are the apple of his eye in the Old Testament and with their fathers Abraham, Isaac and Jacob if he blinded them why? And of course now to find the answer to that it takes you have to study your Bible and, and, uh, and begin to look at the chronology of the New Testament. As I told you before the book of John was written somewhere probably about 90, 95 A.D. by the Apostle John, the last living apostle of the, uh, of the Twelve. And when John wrote his gospel the Gospel of John, he did not make one single reference to the kingdom of heaven. Not a one. Not one single reference. Not a one. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was here preaching to the Jewish people, he offered them the kingdom and he offered them the king. They rejected the kingdom and they rejected the king. So what the Lord did was to put them in a state of spiritual blindness. And from 2,000 from 2000 years since that date, the only one Jews that have been saved are those who are the remnant that he talks about in Romans chapter number 11. It's like the remnant that he kept in Judea when he kept a remnant in, uh, in Judah because of his servant uh, David. 
you would keep a light burning. God always has a way of keeping a light burning so that the truth can be disseminated. Now we have a situation here where God has blinded these people. All right, the Jew is blind. The Jew now is no longer the source of the truth. God's name is no longer placed in Jerusalem in the sense that it had been before because the Jew through the, through the priesthood was the teacher, the one who propagated the truth, got the scripture out through the apostles and all of that. Now we have a situation to where the word of God is not coming from the Jew. So where's it going to come from? So what happens? You see what happened? You see, you see how this begins to take shape for you, begin to understand the correlation of what's going on here. So what happens? Well, what happens is simply that the church of God, which is the body of Christ, which has been a mystery up until this point, the church was present while Christ was here on this earth, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't understood until the Lord God called the apostle Paul and began to reveal to him the mystery of the body of Christ. And let me show you where you can find that uh, reference to it. Look at the book of, uh, of uh, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 15. Ephesians 2.15. We have two big, and the word big is not maybe not the best term to use. We have two profound sources of truth. In the Old Testament, the source of truth is the Jew, not the Gentile, not the pagan. Now, we have something that is altogether different from that. Look at what the Apostle Paul, that great heretic that they talk about all the time on the internet, you know. <clears throat> Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 15. Now watch carefully. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make, now watch this, in himself of twain two. Only two, not three, four, five, six, but two. Twain to make in himself one new man. Now watch this. Soul making peace. Peace where? The peace between the Jew and the Gentile. For it was a hard matter for the Jew to accept the fact that the Gentile could stand in the same relationship with God that he did. He had a hard time. This is why the Judaizers were so influential during the first part of the formation of the church of God. And they brought in circumcision, keep the law of Moses and so forth. It's because the Jew, his culture had taught him, as, as, as Simon Peter said, I have not entered into the house of a Gentile and will not. And then the Lord, of course, showed him what I've cleansed, don't call unclean. We have a Jew and a Gentile brought together to become one new man. Now, there may be other interpretations of that scripture, but what I see here is the one new man. It is no longer bond or free, Jew nor Gentile, red, yellow, black, and white that make up the body of Christ. Once in that body, they lose racial, ethnic, and all their other uh, distinctions that they had as a member of the body of Christ. They are born again believers. This is why we've got a problem with, uh, not so much a problem, but you have to watch carefully the, uh, uh, the Messianic movement. There's a lot of born again Jews who like to retain their identity as Jews. Well, I have no problem with them retaining the identity of a Jew. That's a cultural thing. And it's all right to retain your identity as a Jew as a cultural thing and say, you know, my mother and my father and so forth and so on, go back. But the problem is when you start trying to drag any part of Judaism, whether it be the feast days, the sacrifices, or anything into the body of Christ, you have adulterated the body of Christ and the gospel of the Son of God. Because he made of twain one new man. Now you remember I told you last week about the Hebrew Roots Movement and the Hebrew Roots Movement teaching people essentially that the Apostle Paul is a heretic or, uh, they, you know, sometimes you can imply things and you can, uh, you can have a tacit approval of something and not say it verbally, but you can, Im you, can, you can imply it. The idea is that the Apostle Paul is a, is a renegade apostle who came in late into the scene 
and, and created, formulated this, this, all this Gentile doctrine of how that the church is made up of Jew and Gentile and that he was influenced greatly by the mystery religions of his day, Mithraism, uh, Sybil, uh, Isis and Osiris and all these other mystery religions. And this is why the Apostle Paul uses the terminology, these mysteries were revealed to me. If you remember, Paul had been saved three years when he went to Jerusalem the first time. Fourteen years later, he went the second time. So 17 years after his new birth, he went down and he confronted Peter with a problem that Peter had by uh, capitulating to the Judaizers. He was doing that. We're talking about Peter now. We're talking about one of the twelve. Now think about it for a minute. If you were there living the first century after Christ, and you were among these people, and you saw Peter being confronted by this outsider, the one who had persecuted the church, by Paul, Saul of Tarsus, how would you have, how would you have taken that? Especially if you'd been there at Caesarea Philippi when he said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And you took that to mean Peter. Now, I don't believe it's Peter, but a lot of people do. Let's say you had taken that to mean Peter. The Lord's going to build his church on Peter. And now here's this outsider who was the persecutor of the church all of a sudden confronts him and says, You're dead wrong. What does that mean? That means you have to take sides. You have no choice in the matter. You've got to choose which side are you going to be on. Are you going to choose Peter or are you going to choose Paul? Well, I just go to the Scripture. What Scripture? <laughs> Hadn't been written. The Scripture was being written while all of this was transpiring. And the last book of the New Testament written was somewhere around 90, 95 A.D. in the reign of Domitian. Here we are 17 years after the, the crucifixion of Christ. And, you know, you go back and look at the chronology of the New Testament books. When they're written, you have to look at them carefully a lot of people believe that the first book Paul wrote was 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. The first book was 1st Thessalonians. That he didn't get into Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. The prison epistles were written later on in his ministry. Because we know he was in a hired house in Rome. He was kept there. So we know that these books, they're not all written in the same year. We have many Christians living in the first century after Christ that never saw a New Testament like you have. They weren't brought together, compiled together as, as 27 books what they had, maybe a book or two, or, or maybe no books, but the personal testimony of the people that knew them, you know, whatever. Uh, this is why John writes his gospel so late in the ministry, so late is because the gospel of John makes no reference to the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of John, these things are written that you might believe, and believing have everlasting life. Take the gospel of John, lay it down next to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the revelation given to the apostle Paul, and you'll see where they connect completely. That's right. And there's, there's no Sermon on the Mount in it. So now when you come back and look at this thing, you say to yourself, all right, so we have progressive revelation, and we do because the church is the body of Christ. The mysteries revealed to the Apostle Paul, these mysteries, musterion is the Greek word, it simply means something that comes by revelation from God. And revelation from God is a very important thing. Now here we have to make a choice. Do we believe that Paul is a genuine apostle. The church at Corinth had a problem with him because the church at Corinth doubted his credentials. And he told the church at Corinth plainly, he said, since you doubt the voice of God speaking in me, he dealt with that issue. He said, truly the signs of an apostle have been wrought by me. God proved that Paul was his apostle. And why is it so important? Because the, big, the vast majority of the New Testament is written by Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul. It's written by him. The revelation shows up later, folks. Now, here's the problem. If you come along like the Hebrew Roots Movement does, and they take truth, they take truth. I don't believe in relative truth. Truth is truth. Truth is absolute. Is the Old Testament true? Is it inspired Scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is what gives it power, because it is, because it is Scripture. But here's the problem. If you try to take Old Testament revelation and ram it into New Testament revelation, especially when we're talking New Testament. When I say New Testament, what, I'm, what am I talking about? What's it say in Hebrews 9? Without the death of the testator, the testament is not in force, right? right. That's New Testament. Yeah. Okay? I know we use words, and words, you know, you can use words, toss them around, and folks understand them as they understand them. But the New Testament did not start with Matthew. That's, right. That's not the New Testament. <laughs> 
The New Testament started with the shed blood of the blessed Lamb of God on the cross. Without the shedding of blood, there is no the uh, kene diatheke, the new, the new covenant, translated covenant and testament in the same book. Word is translated differently in different places, same word. So with the New Testament being brought into force, we have the Hebrew roots movement and many of their offshoots and those that, you know, they're like them and so forth. They're telling people today that you have to keep the law of Moses, you have to keep the Sabbath day, you have to observe the Feast of Tabernacles, you have to observe the Feast of First Fruits and the Passover and all these other things because these, these things are genuine and real and they came from God. And all that the Apostle Paul, or all, not Paul, but all that Christ did when he showed up was to, was to fulfill them in the sense that he brought them into the open and made them real to mankind, how that God was in Christ ratifying all of the Old Testament doctrines and all the Old Testament truths. Well, now, uh, it, once again, is the Old Testament true? Absolutely. Can you say a word against the Feast of Tabernacles? Absolutely not. Would I say a word against the Passover? No. But what does Christ say about the Passover? He said, I mean, what does Paul say about the Passover as it relates to Christ? Christ, our Passover. When you get into terms like that, then you can see that the Apostle Paul is taking that which was in the Old Testament and showing you how it has been fulfilled in Christ. Every single promise that you can find bound up in the Old Testament is not fulfilled in man, but it's fulfilled in a man, the man, Christ Jesus. So, when you, now of course you may not believe that, you may not, you may not agree with that, you may be post raw millennial and, and uh, a lot of folks are and, and, uh, and uh, I've, all, I've looked at their side and I've tried to study, I've tried to see how their perspective could be on things. I'd like, if, for example, if I'm amillennial, I don't believe there is a millennium, that's what the word means, it negates it. If I'm post millennial, I mean that means that there is a millennium, but that millennium is a spiritual thing and that Christ is going to come back at the end of the millennium. And a lot of post-millennial pre preachers and teachers teach that Christ is coming back at the end of the millennium. He's going to set the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left hand, and He's going to call an end to it, and that's going to be it. But in the process of that, they have to spiritualize the idea where the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. And when, uh, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached to the ends of the earth, then He said, then shall the end come. And so you've always had this, this, uh, this mandate to go out and preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. But he's not talking about the gospel of the grace of God. That has nothing to do with the coming of Christ. He's talking about the gospel of the kingdom. You see. So, you, you, of course, you believe by that. You have to believe, and a lot of them believe this, that the earth is going to get better, 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 and that the church is going to convert the world. Well, that's, that, that's wonderful that that happened. You know, I wouldn't try to be critical of anything like that. That would be wonderful. But has it happened? The world has converted the church, folks. That's a fact. I saw a cartoon the other day where this guy, he, he was all dressed up, his hair flowing down his back, and he, he was dressed up like a hippie back in the 70s or the 80s. <coughs> and he had, his, he had his LSD and his dope and all of this stuff. And then right across from him, he was looking at this guy who was essentially dressed up just like him, but this guy was a follower of Jesus. And the caption at the bottom said, Who's converting who? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> That's fact, folks. That's fact. So, but anyway, when we look at these mysteries, if you can get it in context, and context means that you have to place it chronologically and doctrinally, you have to understand what's going on in the New Testament, that the New Testament is not a book written for you to just pull out one little, uh, a little uh, moral statement over here and and find you some doctrine that you like and put the two of them together and create some kind of a, of a faith. The New Testament is simply written as the authors were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it. And then the Holy Spirit Himself, who's the author of it, came into this world to help us rightly divide it and to guide us into all truth. Amen. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. And you're talking about the Old Covenant. Right. Well, it is you see? Well, I know it does, but I mean Testament or Covenant. The idea is that 
when God made a covenant with Abraham, not Abraham, but with Moses, he made a covenant with him, you see. And he brought them under blood. He ratified it with blood. But God Almighty had brought down a covenant or given a covenant to Abraham long before that, which was grace. Amen. You see, and, and what you're saying is that, that in the book of Hebrews, he's talking about that old covenant, Jew, compared to the new covenant or New Testament, and showing how the old fades away and the new replaces it. Amen. Exactly, that's what's going on. That's what's happening in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, written to Hebrews. That's what it's about, okay? The book of Hebrews. Am I a Hebrew? No. No, I'm not a Hebrew. But if you get over there in the book of Hebrews and start reading that thing, you're going to find out time and time again. Hebrews 6, verse 6. Look at that. Not right now, but when you get home, read it. Time and time again, he warns them. Don't turn away from the truth you've received. Don't try it underfoot, the blood of the Son of God. Don't do it. Don't walk back. Don't go back to where you came from. Now that doesn't sound like the Apostle Paul who says that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise till the day of redemption. Amen. Yet Paul might have written Hebrews. Right. So where does Hebrews fit? Hebrews is a transitional book, just like the book of Acts is talking about the transitional period. The book of Acts is the history of the early New Testament church in the first century recording the transition from, from, from the Old Testament covenant or the Old Covenant, to the New Covenant. The book of Hebrews is the doctrine of the transition from the Old Testament into the New. That's what you've got. Those two books complement each other. It'll probably be the statement of faith during the tribulation period, too. Well, that's who it's coming to, isn't it? It's the time of whose trouble? Exactly. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. So, uh, but you know, since you mentioned that, it probably... Uh, you know, God knows all things. He knows the end and the beginning. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to be perverted. He knows, how, he knows what's going to be changed. He knows what's coming. And it could be that He prepares people for that when it does show up. Right. And the tribulation period is the time of Jacob's trouble, seven years. And an angel flies through the heavens preaching what kind of gospel? And what's that gospel? What does He say? That's right. That's right. Does that sound like uh, the same thing that's being preached by the Apostle Paul when he said, I went down and checked with them in Jerusalem to see whether I'd run in vain. He compared his gospel with their gospel. You remember? He said, this gospel that I preach, I received it not of men. You say they're different gospels? No, different dispensations. The only gospel there is is trust God, believe Him, and trust Him. But the fact is, if you only know so much, there's only so much you can trust. There's only so much you can receive. There's only so much. So in a situation like you have today where you're standing in brilliant light, shining forth from the cross of 2,000 years ago, for somebody to drag you back under the law is, a, is an insult to the work of Christ. And it's turning the light off of the gospel and not shining it on it. So the reason for all of this is a red flag. You've got to watch, you've got to watch uh, a lot of times they're well-meaning Messianic Jews. I've listened to their testimony and I'm certain that they're born again. But they, they have a tendency to, go, to cross over from a cultural thing into a doctrinal thing. Yeah. It's one thing to be a cultural Jew, fine, good for you. But when you start making it a doctrinal thing and, make, and saying that this has to be today, and making an application of it today, you're getting in trouble. And this is why the apostle says in the book of Ephesians, to make of twain one new man. And so what does that mean then, preacher? That means in Christ there is no distinction whatsoever. Does, does that mean then the Jew doesn't have that special distinction he had in the Old Testament? Absolutely. That means that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is no hierarchy in the body of Christ. You're either born again or you're not. If you're born of the Spirit of God, you're a son of God. You look at the, you look at the term son of God, especially in the book of Galatians 3 over there, which is talking about the seed of Abraham. Look at the sons of God as it appears throughout all the New Testament, and you will see absolutely no uh, distinction made as sons of God. You're a son of God or you're not a son of God. If you're a son of God, you have full privileges. 
full That's rights, good. complete and absolute access to the Father. Whether you're a Romanian, a Yugoslavian, an Indian, an Englishman, an Irishman, an American, African, whatever you are, it makes no difference that in Christ you lose those distinctions. Say, so why do you do that? Because there's only one new man, and that one new man has been born of that second man, last Adam. Being born of that second man, last Adam, you are as if you were being as if you were coming forth from the first Adam. Tell me something. How many racial distinctions and how many different types of distinctions were present at the birth of Seth, for example? Let's take Cain and Abel. How many? Just one. Because there's only one father on the earth, right? There was just one. Now, being one father on the earth, that makes the Lord Jesus Christ, He's called the second man. That means from Adam to Christ, all of those were part of the first man. The Lord Jesus is the second man, so therefore being the second man, He, as the last Adam, when He rose from the dead, the last Adam gives birth through the union with His spiritual bride, us, that we are begotten again to a lively hope through the Lord Jesus Christ into the future. There's only one birth for all of us, one Father for all of us, and not a bunch of different ones. So therefore the Jew and the Gentile and the bond and the free and the red and the yellow and the black and the white and the rich and the poor and what have you have no specific identity in Christ. Amen. That's, good. Amen. That's truth. That's what I believe. I believe it with all my heart. And I do not believe in a religious hierarchy. I do not believe in a priesthood, a Nicolaitan priesthood set aside for a certain select few. We are priests. Peter said priest, a royal priesthood. All right. Now, we have these mysteries. If you'll notice the Apostle Paul, he quotes Isaiah 6. He quotes Isaiah 6 because Isaiah 6 is a prophecy that speaks into the future of what God's going to do with the Jewish people. And Paul said, well spake Esaias. You see the emphasis? You see how he emphasizes this? In other words, Isaiah knew exactly what he was talking about. <laughs> or something of that nature when he talked about you being blinded. And why is the Jew blinded? Because the Jews are hard. Listen, the only place on this earth where everybody argues with everybody is Israel. <laughs> that's truth. <laughs> they argue. I mean, that's the. <laughs> they're a smart bunch. Don't take. Don't misunderstand that. They're selling technology to the rest of the world. Uh, watch some of the documentaries made about Israel right now. Tel Aviv, Israel is one of the high, uh, high pressure play. High, high, they're, they're moving. They're flying. Everything's coming out of Tel Aviv. That's a smart bunch. And if you go back and you look at the, uh, 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 what do they call that thing, that, uh, the uh, Nobel, Nobel, Nobel Prizes, you have more Jews that have Nobel Prizes than anybody else on this earth. And that's a fact. So why? Probably God gave them a lot of this ability, this, this uh, intelligence, and this survivability because of what they would be going through. And they have been through it. One of, the, one of the problems you have right now, if you try to witness to a Jew, one of the problems you have is the Holocaust. Another problem you have is the pogroms that took place back in the Middle Ages when they tried to wipe Jews from the face of the earth. Another problem you have is the Crusades when they came into, came into Israel and they crucified Jews along with Christians. You have, a, you have a history loaded with persecution of Jews. So do Jews trust Gentiles? No. And they don't trust us. Uh, but the Jews are learning that the, the church, the true Christian believers, not, not the awe and the post, not the bunch that crucified them, not the bunch that persecuted them, but the evangelical type Christians, the ones who are essentially premillennial, the ones who believe that Israel is going to be elevated once again to the head of all the nations. That's why they go over there and support Israel. That's why they're there now. Uh, right, I saw a thing a couple of nights ago where they're headed over there for the Feast of Tabernacles. The Jews, uh, Christians are. They go to Israel every year to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, if you do it as a cultural thing, you know, as camaraderie from one to another, you know, you might kind of turn your head away. But as far as the Feast of Tabernacles is concerned, will that do one thing for you? No. Not one thing. Not one thing. But you're showing the Jews that you're, you're their friend and that you want to support them. And they know they have a lot of support from the Christian community. Right now in Syria, Hafas Assad, who is a Shiite Muslim, by the way, 
He's an Alawite. His son, Bashir Assad, who's the present dictator in Syria, is a Shiite Muslim. Now, that's not mostly known, you see. This is why Iran and Hezbollah support him, and this is why Saudi Arabia and most of the other area around in there hate him. They're killing each other right now in Syria. The rebels that are coming against Assad are killing each other. How many of you knew that? They're killing each other. Just a couple of days ago, about five, seven of them got, were, were, were killed in a battle. The, the, the so-called, uh, what do they call them, uh, uh, the insurgents, they've got a name for them, uh, moderate, I think that's the term. The moderate insurgents are beginning to realize that this Al-Qaeda uh, element that's coming in from everywhere in the world, and by the way, Al-Qaeda includes not only Arabs, they include, they include uh, Westerners, uh, mercenaries, they're all coming in there. And they're trying to come in there and, and take over that country completely and drive the Syrian, put the Syrian, uh, Syrian under their authority. And what they're going to do, of course, you know, is create a Muslim caliphate. And that's what's happening. And now the people in Syria, the Muslims in Syria, are beginning to wake up to what's going on. And they're turning against them. And while I'm on this subject, there's been quite a few times it's been mentioned about what they're really fighting about over there in Syria. Yeah. What they're really fighting about is a pipeline. Yeah. A pipeline, money. <coughs> a pipeline that runs through Syria up to the north. And that pipeline is going to carry trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars worth of profit, billions and billions and billions. And that money, Assad does not want to fall into the hands or Israel to profit from it or Saudi Arabia to profit from it or any of these other Arabs around there which are Sunnis. So we've got a situation developing here in Syria where a Shiite along with Iran, Hezbollah, and of course we have Mr. Putin who stepped into this thing and they are coming in there fighting over money. That makes more sense to me than anything because they, they gassed the people two years ago. Over 100,000 of them have died. So why now all of a sudden are they, are they ready to jump in and do something about this? Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. But this it will be. Yeah. Trillions of cubic feet. And it's not for, for a hundred, uh, ten years. They said that this thing will last for, for a long, long time. Yeah, and so when you get something where you've got all of this energy, all of a sudden it shows up. Yeah. You have like fracking that's going on in this country. Right. We're going into rocks and they literally just explode a rock. And new technology, they're able to force oil or gas locked into that rock out. So what's it doing? It's creating an overabundant supply of, 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 uh, of uh, resources. So what does that do to the market? What does that do to the dollar? Uh, it, the profit drives it down. So if you were ExxonMobil or you were, uh, 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 what's that British Petroleum BP? If you were one of these big operators, if you couldn't control it, what would you do about it? Somebody has to pay for wars, folks. When Adolf Hitler was fighting, when, Adolf, when Germany was building the Autobahn and all of that stuff between World War, between the, when, uh, 1929, Black Friday, when the stock market nosedived, the dollar bill was shut off in this country. But all of a sudden, money started flowing into Germany. And Adolf Hitler was getting money from all kinds of different places. Germany was prospering, was growing, and America was languishing. The money supply that was cut off was still around. Money didn't just disappear. So what's going on? It's the people who pull the strings, the elitist. And here's the thing you get into, and I'll move on. I won't get back on this long. But here's the thing. You watch, here's what's important about it. This is very important. Anytime you get into this thing about conspiracies, well, who's doing this? Who's behind this? What's going on here? What about this group? What about this group over here? 
Remember this, Satan never puts all of his eggs in one basket. That's right, that's right. Never. And he's the author of confusion. Yes, he is. But just ask yourself a question right now. Do you live in a country where our infrastructure is so critical that if something happened, that your dollar bill could dry up overnight? How many of you believe that? You better believe it. When I came in here this morning, I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I just happened to look up into the sky. How many of you saw those vapor trails? Did you see that? Crisscrossed everywhere, all over the sky. When I studied flying, I learned a few things, and one of them is called a, a federal airway. A federal airway is when an airplane takes off from Chicago, Illinois, or Detroit, or New York, or someplace like that. It flies to uh, flight level 30,000, 35,000 feet. It gets to that flight level, and then it gets on a certain predetermined path and it's in constant contact with the ground. And it flies that, that's an airway. It flies that to wherever it's going. It flies at a certain altitude. If you're going north and south, you're going at a certain altitude, east and west, you're at another altitude. That way you don't slam into each other. So you fly that airway to wherever you're going. When I looked up into the sky this morning, this is what I saw. Now folks, birds didn't do that. <laughs> What's going on? They're called vapor trails. They're also called, what's that other word for them? Chemtrails. They may still be out there, I don't know, time you have services over with, go out there and look up. Say, so do you believe in conspiracies? I believe in Psalm 2. And Psalm chapter number 2 says plainly there's a conspiracy going on against the Lord and against His Christ. All right, so now 2,000 years ago, you've got all these mysteries, mystery religion that I mentioned to you just a moment ago. And these mystery religions were big. They were big in that uh, ancient world. And so the Apostle Paul is accused of borrowing from these mystery religions and formulating his New Testament doctrine. Now, when we talk about New Testament doctrine, we're talking about what you preach and teach and, and you've been listening to all your life because the New Testament doctrine of the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile, one and the same, the body of Christ, that where a man loves, a husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave, him, gave himself for it. That's the mystery of the body. The mystery of godliness, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was manifest in the flesh. Did I mess up? You see the difference? God was manifest in the flesh. All right. Then in the book of Revelation, chapter number 10, it says the mystery of God will be revealed. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. So did the Apostle Paul believe that the Lord Jesus Christ was God? Did the early disciples, 12 apostles of the Lamb, excluding Judas Iscariot, did they believe the Lord Jesus was God? What did Thomas say? My Lord, my God. All right. You can't find one place in what the Apostle Paul taught that contradicts what the early 12 or the original 12 were taught straight from the uh, mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not one. Not one. There's no contradiction whatsoever. But the Apostle Paul taught the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ presented the kingdom of heaven. John the Baptist, who he said, this is Elijah if you'll receive him, was the forerunner of Christ, right? He prepared the people for Christ. You go back and re read the book of Malachi and you'll see when John the Baptist shows up, or rather when Elijah shows up, he has a reason for that. He turns the, he turns the hearts of the fathers to the children, all right? John the Baptist, Isaiah chapter number 40, had a specific ministry when he came to this earth. He was the forerunner of Christ. When Christ showed up, he came and presented that ministry to Israel. John the Baptist says, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Is there anything in that statement that, that the Apostle Paul ever said that would disagree with that? No. Let me tell you why that's important. If Paul created his own religion from a mixture of Judaism and the mystery religions of his day and sat down and made up all of this stuff, there would inevitably be conflicts 
between what the apostles taught and the Old Testament Scripture itself. Now, how many of you know that Muhammad, 600 and something A.D., I forget exactly the dates, Muhammad's the father of uh, Islam, and 600 A.D., long after the New Testament canon of Scripture has been closed, it's finished. How many of you know that Muhammad created his religion from taking Old Testament text, <coughs> New Testament text, and he sat down and he created his own religion? The Quran is a product of a man creating his own religion. Then he wrote the Hadith, and the Hadith is his commentary on the Quran. In other words, here's what I wrote, here's what it means. All right. Did Paul do that? When Joseph Smith up there in Elvira, New York, started to receive these tablets from, uh, from the angel, he created a religion. Joseph Smith created a religion that is a mixture of Egyptian, uh, 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 Masonic, Catholicism, and Judaism, priesthood, temple, all this stuff. He created a religion himself. He put it together and then wrote it out. And what they have in their hand today is what's called the Book of Mormon. And the Book of Mormon. Does the Book of Mormon, does the Book of Mormon agree with the Old Testament? No. Does it agree with the New Testament? No. It's got some of the wildest stuff you ever read in your life. But the point is very clear. Muhammad created a religion. Joseph Smith created a religion. And the religions that they created can easily be checked by opening up the Bible and comparing Scripture with what they teach in that. Take the Old Testament from Genesis through Malachi. Find one place where what Paul wrote contradicts the Old Testament. You won't find it. Take everything the Lord Jesus Christ taught when He was here 2,000 years ago and compare it with what Paul wrote. Are there any contradictions? Absolutely not. No contradictions. Why? Because Paul did not create a new religion. They were already called Christians at Antioch. And the Apostle Paul received the revelation from God as to the essence of the New Testament church, doctrine of the New Testament church, future of the New Testament church, polity of the New Testament church, and everything is related to that. Now here's the thing. God chose one man, Saul of Tarsus, a Jew who was a persecutor of the church, to take that man and save him on the road to Damascus and then take him into Arabia immediately, he said. I conferred not with flesh and blood. Went into Arabia. There he began to reveal the mysteries. And I have a feeling about the, as far as the mysteries are concerned, I don't think he revealed all of them to him at one time. I think it took, it was over a span of time. And, uh, as, as the mysteries were revealed to him. Well, we've run out of time. It's 15 minutes till. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll pick it up again next week. Brother, Brother Grady, it's good to have you this morning. Would you lead us in prayer?